and pro provocative uh, session. So thank you. And it is a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'm beaming to you from my administrative office at Trinity. So it is not bedecked with lots of books, but as Christopher noticed, it enables me to look out and study the book of nature more directly. So uh, this is something that <laughs> I'm invited to do here. And we have a rich array of panelists for you today. I'll mention each and welcome each and then introduce each one more fully be before uh, each speaks. So we're delighted to have with us Reverend Dr. Rachel Mash, Dr. Sylvia Kiesmat, Dr. Elizabeth Perry, and Archbishop Mark McDonald. Welcome to all of you. It's just a delight to have you all here. So our first speaker is Reverend Dr. Rachel Mash, who is the Environmental Coordinator of the Anglican Church of Southern Africa, and that includes South Africa, Eswatini, Lesotho, and Namibia. And Dr. Mash, based in Cape Town, South Africa, and beaming there from there today, is the Secretary of the Anglican Communion Environmental Network. She recently received the Cross of St. Augustine for services to the Anglican Communion for raising awareness of the urgent need to implement the fifth mark of mission in the Anglican Communion. Congratulations, Rachel. Rachel also works with the Green Anglicans Movement, which has spread to 10 countries across Africa. Her publications include Renewing the Life of the Earth, Christian Discipleship and Environmental Action, Grove Books 2021. No mean feat to publish in the midst of a pandemic. Congratulations, Rachel. Great to have you here. Welcome. Thank you so much. And it's wonderful to be with you this evening and great to see um, some friends and uh, well-known faces with us this evening. I believe you've had an amazing session earlier on in terms of looking at theology and we're going to be looking now about how does the church respond, some of the practical ways in which the church can respond to these incredible challenges that we face. So I'm just going to start by sharing my screen. If you can indicate that you are seeing it properly. Looking good. Is it looking good? Are you at the, I just want to put it to the first slide. Okay, all good? All good. Creation, care, and the church. How do we as the church respond to the incredible challenges that we face? In our context, we say that there are three particular areas that we need to focus on. First of all is our worship and our spirituality. Secondly, we look at the local congregation. And then thirdly, we look at the national and regional action. Often people think that you need to start with the action. But then you end up with the same old church just with a recycling bin. We need to actually change our worship and our spirituality in order that God and the Holy Spirit can be guiding us into the actions that we should take place. So what can we do around our worship and spirituality? You've spent several hours now looking at the theology of preaching, looking at our prayers, one of the wonderful things about Anglican worship is that we have this amazing opportunity during the prayers of the people where we can bring in environmental prayers from around the globe and um, drawing from the wells, particularly of indigenous spirituality, of environmental prayers from around the globe. Now that we have access to the Internet, that can be such a rich time. And our liturgies, what kind of environmental liturgies can we bring in? Because as people speak, they begin to think. And liturgy is a wonderful way of actually getting the people of God to begin to think and begin to say things and begin to challenge what they are um, praying about. And we need to get out of the box. We often think that um, church takes place just within the four walls. But how do we, as was mentioned earlier, how do we listen to the voice of God in creation? How do we listen to the first book of God in nature? What actually is the word of God? I think Psalm 19 has it in such a beautiful nutshell. The first half of Psalm 19 tells us about the first book of God, the word of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. 
They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them, and yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. And of course, the second half of the psalm talks about the law of the, the, word, the Lord. So I have this wonderful balance between the two books of God. Now, how often do we get our people out into nature so that they can experience God speaking to them? We have Palm Sunday. Some of us potentially have an early morning sunrise service at Easter. But there are actually very few opportunities when we take our people out into nature. Now, this can be having a whole Eucharist service maybe outside in a beautiful place where we celebrate God's creation or in a degraded place where we lament. Perhaps we can just do the beginning of the service outside. So the opening prayers and the opening hymns can be outside, looking at the trees, looking at the beauty of the sky, and then we go into the four walls. We need to listen more to the first book of God. St. Augustine said, nature is the divine page that you must listen to. It is the book of the universe that you must observe. The pages of scripture can only be read by those who know how to read and write, while everyone, even the illiterate, can read the book of the universe. From our youngest, tiniest children's Sunday school, we can learn to read from the book of the universe. So we need to think, if we're having a lay minister's meeting, our parish council, can we incorporate some of that time in creation, listening to the voice of God? Some of the most profound moments that we have had with young people are when we climb a mountain, have a wonderful hike on the mountain, and just give them a couple of minutes to sit and listen to God on the mountain. We're all called, I think, to have a Jesus-shaped spirituality. And we know that Jesus was very regular in his worship within the synagogue. He was a reader in the synagogue, so he went regularly. And yet it was creation that fed his spirit. He started his ministry with 40 days in the wilderness. And we read in Mark that he was with the animals. And when he had just re received news of the brutal murder of his close friend, John the Baptist, and he had a marathon day of ministry of preaching and feeding that enormous crowd of people, he sends his disciples ahead and he goes up onto a mountain to pray alone. And when he has a big fight with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, again, he goes onto the mountainside to pray alone all night long. And at his final and most challenging time when he was facing death, he chooses to pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. So when we as clergy and as ministers in the Church of God, when we experience those times of stress, those times, where do we go? Can we go into nature and experience the healing presence of God in nature, just as Jesus did? And then we can celebrate environmental days. There are so many of them, and they're so wonderful. World Environment Day, the Church of South India. Every year, the entire, every single congregation in the Church of South India celebrates World Environment Day. We're just coming up for World Water Day. We had a very bad drought in Cape Town a few years ago, and we were going to be the first city on the planet that was going to have all our taps turned off. And we started celebrating World Water Day, um, it, the 22nd of March. And it is so amazing when you think that we were baptized through the sacred waters of baptism. And water is our sacred element, but we also depend on it for everything um, and I think for us World Water Day will never be the same again because we have learnt the value of water. Many of you I hope have heard of the season of creation. A season of creation if I was to say what has been the key thing that has changed our province the province of Anglican Church of Southern Africa it is the season of creation. The season of creation started in the Orthodox Church and the Green Patriarch declared the 1st of September the World Day of Prayer for Creation. And then so the season of creation is from the World Day of Prayer for Creation through to the 4th of October, which is um, obviously St. Francis Day, the patron saint of ecology and animals. And the World Council of Churches adopted it. It was called Time for Creation at that time. The Lutheran World Federation has come on board. 
The Pope has now promoted the season of creation. The Anglican Church uh, passed a resolution at the Anglican Consultative Council in, in um, New Zealand, and Ken Gray, who is on the call here, was part of that resolution. Um, encouraging provinces to celebrate the season of creation. And last year, for the first time, the three wise men, the Pope, the Patriarch, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, signed a joint statement about creation, encouraging people to celebrate the season of creation. And for me, that is one of the most exciting things, that we come together as the ecumenical family to care, to pray, and to act for our common home in the month of September. And then, of course, there are services such as the Earth Day. One of the ways that we can really encourage our young people, and I think all of us have seen an inc incredible fallout of our young people during COVID. We've just lost our young people. I'm sure you've experienced the same. But if you can celebrate the environmental days and invite the young people to do dramas, as we're seeing here, liturgical dances, it encourages them again and will bring young people back to because they feel that they've got something exciting to plan for and to practice for and to take part in the church. And here's just a few um, pictures of different events. This was a Sunday school care for creation event that we had. Of course, there's Harvest Day and creative, using our creativity um, inspires people, encourages them and connects them with their faith and with creation. And water is always something which touches all of our souls. Did you know that water is mentioned 722 times in the Bible? And when we have our baptismal services, we need to bring in issues of water justice. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to reflect again on what water means for us. I think all of us know that Jesus was baptized in, in the Jordan River, but the water that we were baptized with, where did it come from? Most people think that it came out of a tap. We don't know where did that water come from, from which river it is. And what we're encouraging people to do now is to do some research. Find out which is your Jordan River. Where did the water come from that you were baptized with? And go and protect that river. Adopt it as your own Jordan River and do what you can with cleanups or protecting it. That is your sacred river. And then St. Francis Day. I think we're all used to having blessings of animals, but it's also a time for us to consider the cruelty towards animals. Where do our food products come from? How are the chickens or the cows that we may be eating being treated? Are we stopping them from worshipping God? And um, to challenge people, not just to think about our companion animals, but to think about our food sources. What is our theology of food? Are we silencing the voices of creatures that should be praising God? And then pilgrimages. Um, this was the Bishop of Saldana Bay who had a Lenten pilgrimage about four years ago. And right through Lent, he went and visited all his different congregations. And I know in different parts of the world, the idea of pilgrimages coming again and being quite exciting. It's interesting to see in Scotland how they are re um, um, opening some of the pilgrimage sites for people. And we know about the Camino de Santiago in Spain, but they're now getting Caminos in different parts and it would be exciting to see perhaps if one can encourage pilgrims around parts of your beautiful land. In Spain, more people walk the pilgrimage of Santiago than go to church during a year. So there's something about pilgrimages that touches people's soul. And then our Eucharist. Do we just bring our bread and wine or do we actually think about where the bread came from, where the wine came from? I remember one Eucharist service where the discussion was about who made the bread. They used real bread on that day. And they said this bread has been made by somebody who woke up at four o'clock in the morning to go to the bakery and to bake it. And this wine was made on a vineyard in Cape Town where the workers are being abused. This brings the reality of, of the, the elements that we use in our Eucharist. We need liturgies of lament and liturgies of celebration. Lament is an area where we as a church are often very weak. 
We're okay about personal confession, but lament, communal lament for what we have done is an important thing for us to do, especially for those who are struggling with eco-anxiety and stress. We need to lament, to confess that we are part of the destruction that has taken part on this planet. Find and share environmental liturgies, especially from indigenous Anglicans around the world. We are so blessed. We have fantastic indigenous Anglicans in New Zealand, Aotearoa, here in Canada, different parts of the world. Hunt for them, use them. They're so amazing and so inspiring. What can you do as, as the Anglican Church of Canada is to authorize new Eucharistic prayers, find other ones that, for the, the prayers of the people, uh, put them on your website, circulate them, share them. Let us have liturgical renewal. Um, the Anglican Community and Environmental Network, together with the Anglican in, um, Indigenous Network, provide, produced four videos last year, which are called the Prophetic Indigenous Voices. And if you can find them, they're on YouTube. Little portions of the prophetic indigenous voices will really challenge your spirituality and get you to think deeper. And I'm sure Elizabeth will also reflect on these. So from start with spirituality and then move to actions of the local church. This is a picture I love to share. This is a church in um, Mozambique. And when they built the church, they built a water pump right at the door of the church. So when people come to church, they also draw water. And what a wonderful reflection of the life of the church and also providing water for the local community. And then we can look at our use of water. Can we have water harvesting, tanks, grey water? Um, look at our toilets. Are we, are we stopping having the um, leaks in toilets? Do we have a dual system flush? There are so many ways, practical ways, that the church can look at reducing our footprint on this planet. Here's some um, people looking at changing their light bulbs, at the water heater geyser, putting it on a timer. Practical ways, small ways that we can make a difference. And then our relationship to the soil. Do we have land in our churches which is not growing anything? When people are hungry, food gardens, a way for the young people to be employed. And then we find that our youth activities, Sunday school outings where you connect the fun hikes with the spirituality have been one of the key things of getting young people involved. Everybody likes to hike, but the difference between a hike and a holy hike or a spiritual hike where you connect the kids with their spirituality, really can transform lives. Tree planting has been a very important thing for us. Um, Revelation says the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. Majority of our bishops now are using confirmation as a time when they encourage all the young people to plant a tree. And many of our celebrations or conferences Paternal festivals, people are encouraged to plant a tree. And it's also a way for young people to make some income. This is a young man, Benjamin, and he um, paid for himself to go through university from selling little tree seedlings. And we found that linking ecosystem restoration with spiritual moments has been very important. As I mentioned, confirmation, planting trees for baptism, planting trees for funerals and for weddings, there's actually one funeral director in the Diocese of Harare, and now every time they have a funeral, they plant a tree. We need people to grow trees, and the trouble is if you plant a tree, then maybe it dies. But if you have planted a tree as a symbol of your confirmation or a, a, a symbol of your wedding, you will look after it and care for it. And it also helps you to see how your spirituality can grow. During COVID, we lost a lot of people and we were not able to go to funerals. And that has, as you know, has been very distressful for people. And we found that um, planting memorial trees has been very healing. This is a picture of the, a tree that was planted at one church for the members of the Mother's Union who passed away in 2020. And this tree becomes a place where Mother's Union members can come and just mourn and 
celebrate her life and remember her as they water the tree, as they pull out weeds, it becomes quite a precious, special place. And then, of course, you can involve your congregations in recyclings and cleanups. Here's a picture of Archbishop Tutu. I think this was his 70th birthday. He cancelled his party, went and did a big cleanup, and then gave all the kids who participated cake. And this is Archbishop Tabo being involved in, in cleanups. And I think what is important is that the leadership get involved, and then people find it to be quite an inspiring and spiritual moment. I always remember we did one cleanup, um, and I was busy chatting away to the archdeacon about something or other and our bags were empty and then this little girl comes up to the archdeacon she's about seven years old and said father why is father's bag empty and he got such a fright that he stopped talking to me and he quickly immediately started putting um, plastic rubbish into his bag so when the leadership are involved in these things it inspires other people to do them and this is a beautiful picture from Eswatini in Swaziland of um, a bin that they have outside one of the Anglican schools. And what they've encouraged all their schools there is to make their bins creative to show that we really care about God's creation. So spirituality and then local action. And then here is a cleanup in um, Zimbabwe. This is a shrine to St. Bernard Mizeki in the Diocese of Harare. Every year they have like, well, before COVID, they have like about 20,000 pilgrims and you can imagine the mess that is created. So these young people, they get together and they clean it up because they say our shrine is sacred, so the land must not be filthy. And they take this as their spiritual walk to clean up in honor of the Saint Bernard Mizeki. And very important, whatever you do, mobilize the youth. This is the most important thing. They should be at the heart of your movements. Um, we've done, uh, prepared this Sunday school material called Ryan the Rhino, which we can as, is available freely online. How do your young people and your children get involved in caring for creation? They will inspire and encourage other people. I was on a call a few days ago and some of the lay people were saying, what do we do when our priests aren't interested? And I said, just start with the youth, get the youth doing it, get the young people doing it, and then it'll filter up. And before you know where it is, the priest to be like, what's happening in my church? Everybody's talking about care for creation. And then one of the key things that we've done in AGSA in, in Southern Africa, it's quite a long process and not all of us love canonical processes, but we have greened our canons. So over the years, we prepared, looked at the canons, we got the boffins to look at it, and we brought a resolution to Synod. And now um, the duties of the incumbent include taking care of recreation. When the new priest is installed, he or she has to say that they will take care of environment. Um, it's part of the responsibilities of the parish council. It's part of the responsibilities of the archdeacon when they look at the property they must also check the water bill and the electricity bill so there's about 14 different canons that we have greened and by doing that you begin to change the dna of the church we use social media a very key and um, wonderful thing to get your young people to do in your parish level diocesan level let them run with the social media for care for creation and then the third level is advocacy. How do we act nationally or regionally? How does the voice of the church speak out? Proverbs 31 says, speak up for those who have no voice. Now, there actually is nobody who has no voice. The challenge is nobody is listening. And often that can be a place where the church can lift up the voice of those to whom nobody is listening. So, for instance, recently we had a case um, where in Namibia, a Canadian company called Recon Africa came in and started drilling in the Kavango area, and they were threatening one of the most beautiful unspoiled areas in the whole of Africa. So the bishops wrote a um, petition, and they took it to the consulate of Namibia, and we also got Archbishop Mark signed it, Archbishop Linda, um, Kairos Canada got involved. They took the petition to the headquarters in Vancouver and it began to raise the profile of what was happening in Namibia. Uh, faith community, this is uh, the Green Bishop, Bishop Jeff. They were involved in blocking a nuclear deal in South Africa. 
Um, the government wanted to bring in a secret trillion round nuclear court case and the Southern Africa faith communities took them to court and got it blocked. This is a, a young lady of 77, Reverend Sue. Um, she was arrested in Extinction Rebellion Protest London. Um, she was blocking the road in protest. And she said the reason she protested was, I cannot bear to leave a barren earth to my beautiful grandchildren. She and a Catholic priest and another lay person, they got an incredible amount of publicity over their actions. So as people of faith, sometimes we can really pick up on that media protest. These are a few pictures from Australia where they're protesting against um, the Adani coal project. And we must remember that the best places in the world for solar energy are here in Africa, in Asia. And we need to push away from fossil fuels to encourage the development of solar energy. Many Canadian companies are wanting to come back into Africa and to push for oil and gas. And if you can stand in solidarity with us and say no new oil and gas explorations in Africa, please stand with us on that. We need to listen to and amplify the voices of young people. I think this is one of the saddest posters that I've seen. You will die of old age. Your kids will die of climate change. We have got less than 10 years to turn this climate change around for the sake of our children and for our grandchildren. So let us close with the Lord's Prayer from Ayotria, New Zealand. Eternal Spirit, Earth Maker, Pain Bearer, Life Giver, Source of all that is and all that shall be, Father and Mother of us all, loving God who is in heaven. The hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and justice and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trial too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much, Rach. That was a, a beautiful tapestry that took us from the sacramental to the educational to the political active realm of change. And it reminded me of a title, Blessed Unrest by Paul Hawken. When he looked at the environmental crisis, he of course got depressed, but when he looked at all the thousands, indeed over a million social justice, faith, womenist, feminist, activist, indigenous groups working for change, he couldn't help to be optimistic. It was a blessed unrest. And thank you for sharing this blessed unrest with us today. Beautiful. And it's now my privilege to introduce Dr. Sylvia Kiesmat, who is a wonderful scholar, activist, and farmer based here in Ontario. Dr. Kiesmat is co-chair of the Bishop's Committee on Creation Care for the Anglican Diocese of Toronto, is a well-known biblical scholar, farmer, founder of the Bible Remixed, www.bibleremixed.ca, and the co-author of Romans Disarmed, Resisting Empire, Demanding Justice, from Brazos Press 2019. Now, Sylvia lives on an off-grid permaculture farm with a fluctuating number of people and animals, and actually is involved in the soil in a very direct way. Sylvia, it's wonderful to welcome you here. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Stephen. And um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be part of this gathering, which is very uh, rich and nurturing. And uh, I'd like to thank Rachel for that uh, presentation, which I think complements what I'll be talking about very well. Um, I'm going to, I have two hats uh, that I'm, I'm speaking from. I'm not going to speak from my third permaculture hat right now. Uh, I'm going to talk from the position of one of the co-chairs of the Bishop's Committee on Creation Care. Uh, in that capacity, I work with clergy and lay people in the diocese on resources for our churches related to climate crisis, ecological and racial justice, 
and decolonization, all of those things together. Um, my other hat this afternoon is the context of a biblical scholar who has taught at Trinity uh, and both academic and lay courses on creation in the biblical story. So uh, I'll move back and forth between those a bit. So I'm gonna address the needs of the churches and the needs of the students with whom I've interacted over the years as a teacher in both academic and non-academic contexts. And those things actually overlap. Um, and I should add, as someone that studied at Oxford, I don't think I've ever been surrounded by so many people from the other place at once. It's a little disconcerting, but I'll get over it. So let me begin by saying that I'm in agreement with this morning's speakers, all of whom emphasize that the climate crisis, the collapse of biodiversity that surrounds us and the increasingly catastrophic results of our warming planet is the defining issue of our time. Our clergy and the congregations that they lead know that we are in crisis. And as hard as I think this might be for scholars such as ourselves to hear, they are not looking for intellectual resources so much to help them understand the situation that we find ourselves in. Um, and nor are they looking for the kind of personal individual actions that have failed to halt the trajectory of carbon capitalism and the continued injustices of colonial and racism. The most basic need in the last couple of years that congregations and students have shared with me is fundamentally pastoral and spiritual. Our faith communities are permeated by something that is often called climate grief or climate anxiety, but which could also be called a deep foreboding about what the future holds for them, for their children and for their communities and for the earth. And I would suggest that their primary need in such a context is first and foremost resources and practices for grappling with climate grief and climate anxiety. And, and I should say here, uh, for those people who are settlers, recent, uh, some of whom are recent immigrants, this is a new anxiety for indigenous peoples, for people from the black community, for people who are refugees, this has been going on for a long time already. So what might such resources for grappling with climate grief look like? Well, in the first place, I think we need to reclaim our story, the biblical story, as a vigorous dynamic narrative that gives meaning both to our grief and lament and to our hope. And there are many ways that this happens. First of all, we need to reclaim the biblical tradition of lament as a way of framing and understanding our grief. And, and I'm gonna, Rachel talked about this already and I'm gonna say a little more about it. God knows the place of grief well. God grieved over the violence on the earth in the time of Noah. God mourned the stubborn hearts of a people who didn't know God and therefore did not know their place. God lamented the devastation the people caused on the land and in the lives of the poor. And interestingly, we haven't always been aware of this grief when we've read the text because the translators of the Septuagint and the trans when they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, around the turn of the era, systematically translated the Hebrew word for grief as anger. Since in a Hellenistic context, grief was seen as an inappropriate emotion for God, whereas anger was somehow appropriate. Get, the, get your head around that one. We have a hangover of this in our theology. When we talk about God's anger needing to be appeased, that's why Jesus has to die. This is what a lot of our hymns tell us, right? Whereas the Bible is consistent, the Godward side of judgment is always grief. Why did Jesus die? Not because God was angry, but because of God's love. I mean, when people hold that sign up at baseball games, John 3, 16, God so loved the world, right? This is why God, uh, why Jesus came. And Romans 5 is even clearer on that. Um, it's because of such love that Jesus grieved, that Jerusalem didn't know how to live in peace. It's because of such love that the spirit grieves and groans with a broken creation. But the biblical story also bears witness to the lament of creation and the land. So there's God's lament on one, the one side and the lament of creatures in the land. In Hosea 4, uh, Leviticus, oh, I didn't write it down. Leviticus 18, I think, where the land's going to vomit us out. Romans 8, creation is grieving over all that we have inflicted on the earth. So perhaps living in lament is actually the place we're meant to be right now. And there's four reasons, I think, for this. First, to live in lament is to truly image the God who laments what has happened, uh, the, who laments the brokenness of creation and of community, who laments the loss of the beautiful creatures 
to use Bruce Coburn's language. To lament these things is to image God. Second, to lament is to know that this is not the way the story was supposed to end. We live in the tragic gap, right, of the way this vision the Bible gives us of the way things are supposed to be and the reality. And so we lament that that reality isn't how the place that, that we live, the tragic gap we live in. To lament is also to admit that like God, we are a people of love. We, we grieve the loss of what we love. And I'm going to come back to this uh, a bit in relation to some of the, the talks this morning. Uh, you know, we need to be rooted in the love of creation. And we grieve because the places we love are lost. And as I said, for some people, this is nothing new. Indigenous peoples forced off their land by colonialism have been grieving this loss for a couple of centuries. Black farmers forced out of their, you know, black, the black ancestors taken out of their land in Africa, black farmers forced off their land more recently in, you know, in all parts of Turtle Island, refugees being forced to leave the places that they love. These are communities acquainted with grief. Um, communities that we need to be learning from. And now we join them as the places we love are gone as well. And forced to grieve is to acknowledge perhaps that we are complicit, that we have lost what we love through our own actions, our own addictions, our own needs for security. And this grief is perhaps the hardest to bear, for we are at a loss as to how to change, how to uncouple our imagination from the narrative that our culture tells, the narratives that tell us that our comfort is more important than the life of other creatures. So we're all hungry for repentance, but unsure about what it looks like. You know, when they said, in the words of Leonard Cohen, when they said repent, we wondered what they meant and we grieve our own inability to change. So maybe we need to enable our communities to give voice to lament, to learn how to dwell in that lament, to remember what it is we have lost. Maybe we need to recapture the ancient practice of allowing lament and grief to become the insistent prayer that we bring before the throne of God day in and day out. And of course, we're in good biblical tradition doing this. There are more psalms of lament than any other kind of psalm. And when we dare to voice our lament, just like the psalmist, we're daring to admit we don't have it under our control, right? The songs of lament are ancient Israel's way of saying, God, we know that this is all in your hands. We know you can do something about it. Please help us. Please help us. How long, oh Lord, is another way of putting it. So all of this is to say that maybe lament is a faithful response to be uh, to, to, to be experiencing right now in the destruction that surrounds us. So we need safe communities in which to share, grieve, and rest with our pain. We also need to realize that the biblical story speaks of climate catastrophe in more than one place. What is the story of Noah, if not the story of a climate catastrophe? What is Jeremiah's description of creation coming undone, if not ecological destruction? Also, it's a, uh, it's a description of colonial powers coming in and taking over the land as well. What is Hosea's? And just let me say, you know, we tend to read uh, those passages about the exiles in Jeremiah as if we are the exiles, but really we're the colonial powers, right? Uh, we need to figure out where we fit into this story too. What is Hosea's description of the perishing of wild animals, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, if not an extinction? So what do these stories have to teach us about faithfulness? in the face of climate change. I mean, Noah was a farmer. He knew the importance of genetic diversity, and yet he nurtured a small selection of biodiversity through the deluge, somehow hoping, I assume, that this would make a difference, right? If he was any kind of farmer, he knew that one of each was not gonna be enough. Um, Jeremiah, this is the first thing you learn on a farm, right? Any, any males that are born, you get rid of those. You, get, you need new ones coming in. <laughs> you need some diversity. Jeremiah described the total breakdown of creation, yet he bought a field and called those in exile to plant gardens and create a multi-age, multi-ethnic community. What would that look like today? Zacchaeus wanted to follow Jesus, so he returned the land that he had amassed from his neighbors, essentially an act of reparation. What does that story teach us? about how we can engage in reparation in land back today. It's also becoming increasingly evident that our destruction of creation is closely connected to colonialism and our commodification of the land uh, is connected to the commodification of black and brown bodies. 
And in Canada, this is an area that's increasingly explored in environmental conversations in the US as well, places like Yes uh, Magazine. Our communities and clergy need safe spaces where those who have benefited from colonialism and racism and those who have been the victims of colonialism and racism can together experience reconciliation. And this means that resources are needed for understanding what repentance looks like in relation both to our oppression of the land and of others. And it means being able to explore what forgiveness might look like as well. When, uh, when I, I work with uh, the um, Michisaga Ganeshnabe on, on Curve Lake, I am always overwhelmed by the graciousness with which our conversations are surrounded. I feel so undeserving of that graciousness so often. So we have something to learn about forgiveness there too. In addition to resources and practices for grappling with climate grief, our faith communities also need resources and practices for nurturing hope in our midst, right? This is, this is Brueggemann's two, uh, uh, two ways, two bits of prophetic imagination, right? Bringing pain to expression and envisioning uh, symbols of hope. Um, and so, first of all, our communities need to reclaim their creational home and so many of us this morning have talked about this, Andrew, Jacob, and Rachel so far, and I imagine it's going to come up again. Um, we need to realize again, recognize that the biblical story begins in a food forest, in a place that looked something like Turtle Island before contact. We need to remember that creator's original plan was to hang out by a river in a food forest with a whole bunch of birds and animals and a couple of naked vegetarians. That's how the story begins. And our biblical imagination needs to be shaped by all those stories where creator appears in the wilderness as the story continues. Hagar, Jacob, Moses, the escaped slaves, Elijah, Jesus, that food forest in John's revelation vision. Creation, creator wants to meet us in the wild spaces because those are the places where we are most whole. And don't forget that this is how the story ends. God coming again to dwell with all of creation on earth in a food forest with a river running through it. So what if our liturgies and our preaching and our worship, our missional work, our pastoral efforts all happened in a way that more deeply rooted us in the love of our place, our watershed? And what would a deep grounding in our watershed reveal to us about the love and abundance of creator? And this would also mean rooting ourselves in the vision of hope found in the biblical text as a place of hope for a restored earth. We need to finally end, and this came up this morning, and I already had it in my text, uh, the heaven after we die heresy bequeathed to us by Neoplatonic readings of the biblical text. And here's where I differ, of course, uh, from, from Charles. Um, I don't believe there's two options, annihilation or the eternal life of the soul. The biblical text in Romans 8 and 2 Peter 3 and Revelation 21 all present another option resurrection of the body to live with God in a renewed earth. We need to remember that Adam literally means earth creature and that earth is where we were created to be. The fact is that the Bible embodies a crazy against all the evidence faith that our God specializes in resurrection, especially when things seem hopeless. I mean, every time you get to a dark point in the story and you think, well, this is the end now, you know, that promise to Abraham, not going anywhere. He's pretty old. Uh, you know, the people, the people, oh, they're in Egypt, they're slaves. They're not going to do any redemption. You know, every time Jesus, he's in it, he's in the grave, it's over. No, that's when resurrection happens in this story. And that also means resurrection for us, the earth creatures on the renewed earth. And if we're going to start talking about resurrection, we'll need to strengthen our imagination around what climate justice and creational hope look like in our midst. Um, this is, you know, Jacob's point that we don't know what these new structures will look like. <laughs> we need to realize that God's promise of resurrection is deep and wide, which means that climate justice is impossible without racial justice and indigenous justice. And I don't need to belabor this, you all know this. Um, and once we recognize the breadth of the biblical vision, we will understand why our communities are tired of small actions, such as changing our light bulbs or recycling, that fail to change the trajectory of carbon capitalism and the stranglehold of colonialism on creation. I mean, the whole point about the resurrection is that it so transformed everything 
that it was unrecognizable. People, I mean, people couldn't even tell who Jesus was. We don't know how to imagine what climate justice will look like. So we need to foster, we need to exercise our muscle of an expansive imagination. It's as a student of mine said yesterday to me, it's a weak muscle now. Um, we need to feed that imagination in our neighborhoods. Does it look like a food forest replacing the church parking lot? Does it mean challenging development on wetlands, to use an example that in Ontario right now is very pertinent? Um, does it mean giving land back to Indigenous peoples, uh, church lands back to Indigenous peoples? Um, does it mean settler and Indigenous communities working on a cultural center together, which is happening uh, in a town very close to me right now? What do reparations and land back look like in our context? And I'm just going to throw this one out there. Does the biblical vision of Jubilee have anything to teach us? That's, that would be a whole other talk. There are many resources out there for imagining a flourishing future. We need to be making them available. And Andrew's point of getting on with things and inviting all people of goodwill to join us is very pertinent here. There's a lot going on uh, already that our churches can join in with. The most ambitious project that the Bishop's Committee on Creation Care, which I co-chair, has engaged in to date is our Lent curriculum for all ages, uh, which coincidentally came out this week. It's called Ecological Grief and Creational Hope, and it can be found on the Creation Care page of the Diocese uh, of, of Toronto. Uh, this Lent resource, which is large, contains biblical reflection, some along the lines of what I've shared with you today, opportunities for sharing grief, liturgies that root us in our place. It provides links uh, between ecological degradation and racial and indigenous justice, provides opportunity for repentance and forgiveness, along with actions for children and youth uh, and discussions for children and youth and resources for further engagement and imaginative hope. Each week begins with a short contemplation of what we love about creation as a way to ground our reflections together. Each week also begins with a chance to share grief. And each week include, includes activities and reflections that happen outside, outside of our buildings, uh, rooting ourselves in our, in our watershed. I can share the link uh, for this later. Our next project, incidentally, um, just building on what Rachel said, will be a pilgrimage resource uh, for parishes to, to create a pilgrimage in their watershed uh, for people in, in the parish. It's precisely the sort of thing that we think can begin to meet the needs of our communities by being creating a biblically grounded, safe, pastoral context for lament, repentance, and hope. Now, all of this, of course, begs the question of how our theological colleges engage in clergy, uh, the formation of clergy who are best poised to do these kinds of things in our communities. And I'll be quite frank here. At the moment, the diocese is not looking to our theological colleges for any resources or leadership on this issue, not just Trinity, but any theological colleges. And because this is, I think, because there's a sense that there's nothing in the current curriculum, the, the MDiv curriculum particularly, that addresses the issue of climate change in any depth. And given that this is a defining issue of our time, or one could say the last social issue we might, societal issue we might ever grapple with if we don't do things well, I'm glad Trinity feels that this is something where the Faculty of Divinity needs to provide leadership. But it's going to be a large task. Because just as addressing anti-Black racism or colonization cannot be accomplished by adding a little section onto each course, so the climate crisis will not be easily addressed by tweaking the curriculum. We should not deceive ourselves into thinking that our teaching has been somehow neutral in relation to the current crisis. The roots of our current crisis are deeply embedded in the ways we teach and the content of our courses in theology. My students at seminary, as well as my colleagues at other institutions, share the experience of a disconnect between a creation affirming theology, courses in environmental ethics or, or environmental theology and other parts of the curriculum. So I'm just going to throw out some ideas here that that, you know, might make sense, might not, that probably need to be fleshed out by people with more expertise. But might our teaching of church history and theology have to abandon the privileging of, sorry, I, I already had the word platonic in there, but I'll say rational trajectories that have resulted in colonial Christianity, theologies that emphasize God's transcendence, omnipotence, and wrath 
This is still a dominant paradigm in some of our theological uh, training. What would it look like if our teaching of church history privileged the voices of the vulnerable and centered the theologies of those theologians throughout history, many of them women, who celebrated the goodness of God's creation rather than escape from it? And this morning modeled so beautifully a, re a recovering of that tradition uh, that, was, that was just so lovely to, to witness. What might liturgy look like that is shaped by the lament of creation, the lament of the poor, the pain of indigenous communities, the passion of black communities. Um, and Rachel, refer, Rachel referred to those liturgies that are be, being created around the world. What might liturgy look like that is deeply rooted in our places, in our watershed, in the land where we find ourselves? Liturgy for this place. What would sacramental theology look like that takes the indwelling of the spirit in our watershed seriously? How would our pastoral formation change if we were providing pastoral resources for dealing with climate grief and lament? For dealing with young adults who do not want to have children. My children do not want to have children. With the despair and hopelessness that climate collapse creates in our communities. How are we equipping our clergy for counseling in the midst of the climate crisis? Wildfires, floods, avalanches, unbearable heat. Have, have our clergy been trained to be able to, to help well the people of Lytton? The things that are increasingly challenging our communities. Lytton, for those of you who aren't Canadian, is a, an Indigenous community that was uh, leveled by wildfire this year and then cut off by avalanche and flood. So double whammy. What does mission look like if we're proclaiming good news to all of creation? How was the gospel? our farm animals. I loved that farm animals came in earlier. <laughs> Every year we, we get a couple of pigs and we think, okay, these guys need to root. Where can we put them where they can do that? <laughs> uh, and uh, where can they serve the earth best? What would it look like if we, if we were calling our communities to share good news in the face of climate collapse? What word of hope does the gospel have for climate refugees, for those whose homes have burnt to the ground? What does mission look like when it is untethered from its colonial moorings. And what does our preaching look like if creation is a character in the biblical story? Not just the stage for what human beings are up to, but creation is an actor that we are in relationship with and creation is in relationship with God. What if our preaching grounded us more firmly in creation, called us into our vocation as servants of creation, opened our imagination to the deep sorrow of creation abused and the deep hope of creation loved, treated our relationship with creation in the same way as our relationships with other human beings or with God? What if our preaching did that? What if our biblical studies, this is where it all comes home to roost in my discipline, abandoned our readings of the text as literature or historical criticism or sociology and read the text as a living word, a story that draws us into the passion and joy of a creator who fiercely loves creation and wants us and all creatures to flourish. I know of no place that has a curriculum quite like this. However, I'll say this, if Trinity is hoping to become a leader in these critical times, then the appointment of at least one faculty member who can provide teaching that is biblically deep and theologically vulnerable and missionally imaginative and pastorally sensitive on creation and climate change will be essential. That probably doesn't just describe one person, but <laughs> we can, you can always hope. It may also be necessary to engage in the exciting work of communally rethinking how each part of the curriculum coheres, intersects, and supports the other parts of the curriculum as different facets of each discipline intersect with the story of creation and its abuse and healing. This is not a task for the faint of heart. It is, however, the one way that theological education will be able to meet, or one of the ways that theological education will be able to meet the overwhelming crisis that our church and our world now face. Thank you so much, Sylvia, for your passionate, cogent, evocative, and imaginative reflections. I loved and so appreciate the Emphasis on lament. This is so important uh, for our students who are dealing with eco-anxiety, and I love that you have been working and providing resources on this. Also, the role of love and imagination, so key in this moment. I sometimes ask my students, 
how many of you can imagine the end of the world and infused in post-apocalyptic media? Almost all raise their hands. Then I asked them, how many of you can imagine an end of global corporate capitalism? Very few hands go up. Mm -hmm. Then I ask, how many of you can imagine a flourishing future of mutually enhancing human more than human relationships? Maybe four or five out of 50. The role of the imagination here and the colonization of our imagination by certain forces is such an important horizon. So thank you so much, Sylvia, for that and, and the rich presentation in general. Great. And now it's a wonderful privilege to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Perry. And Dr. Perry is beaming to us from the United Kingdom and is with the Anglican Alliance the Anglic and was with the Anglican Communion Delegation at the COP26 meetings. And Dr. Perry is the Advocacy and Communication Manager at the Anglican Alliance. This group serves to connect, equip, and inspire the worldwide Anglican family to work for a world free of poverty and injustice and to safeguard creation. Dr. Perry leads the Anglican Alliance's environmental work and as mentioned, attended COP26 as part of the Anglican Communion's delegation. So welcome, it's wonderful to have you with us, Elizabeth. Wow, thank you so much. And I'm just completely bowled over by the presentations we've had so far and really quite utterly inspired and excited. And just, it's so good to know that uh, Trinity exists and, and what you're doing and it, it's very moving to and, and, and a real privilege to be a part of it. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, I hope during um, this, there's going to be a, a little reflection as part of it, and I'm hoping that will give us all the time to really start absorbing some of the things we've heard. Um, so I'd like to speak to this um, subject from my position as a uh, working for the Anglican Alliance. Um, because, let me just, sorry, why is that not moving? Ah, oh, what I've done wrong. Let's try that, yeah. So, as the Anglican Alliance, um, we get to see what's happening across the whole of the Anglican Communion. We get to see what's impacting people's lives, we see the blessings and the challenges, and we get to see how Anglicans across the Communion are responding to those challenges. And the triple environmental crises of climate change, biodiversity loss and pollution are absolutely up there amongst the top factors affecting people's lives everywhere. So in my presentation, I want to share some of what we're seeing of those impacts, but I also want to share how Anglicans are responding. And I want to share some of the initiatives and resources and best practices and the wisdom uh, that are within the communion, a lot of which has been alluded to already. So I'll be reinforcing some of what's been said already. Uh, I'm also going to share something about how the Anglican Communion engaged with COP26 and how we plan to build on that uh, this year. So um, this is it in a nutshell. So if you're getting tired, just absorb this slide and then you can <laughs> relax for a bit. So the questions uh, we were asked to address as panelists were to look at how can clergy address the global environmental issues uh, and um, in their parishes, and how can divinity schools prepare clergy for this? So in a nutshell, for me, it's all about relationship. So I always think that the five Anglican marks of mission are the best kept secret of the Anglican communion. They are fantastic. <laughs> um, so first of all, put the Anglican marks of mission front and center, including the fifth mark of mission. Creation care is about sharing in God's ongoing story of love for the world. Within the other thing, or the next big thing is connect. 
discern the body, to use the phrase from Corinthians about how we should prepare for communion, discern the body. Um, are we discerning it? Do we drink and eat destruction on ourselves because we fail to discern the body? The next big takeaway is love the earth, love other people. We've heard about loving the earth. That for me is what it all comes down to. And then use your position as a theological, uh, as, as a parish priest, as, as a divinity school in shaping ordinance, inspire. Inspire them and ask them to try to inspire other people. My conviction, I suppose, is that if you do this, the rest follows. So I'm going to say more about this later on, but if you get the mindset right, I'm convinced the actions will follow. Or if you put it the other way around, actions have to be based in attitudes if they're going to be sustainable. There's no pe point telling people to reduce their carbon footprint if it's not actually based on love or a reason to do it. So they'll do it for, a, if they're anything like me, or rather, I'll do it for a bit and then I give up unless I understand and really care about why I'm doing it. So what is happening across the communion? And how are people responding? And here is a five minute reflection called Troubled Waters um, that shares some of that. And there is a soundtrack, but it doesn't come in for the first 30 seconds. So don't panic, it will come in. So uh, here you go.
Anglicans across the communion are on the front line of the climate emergency. The video reflection shows some of those impacts. As the Alliance, we get to see the devastating impacts of both acute climate shocks, things like hurricanes and wildfires. We get to see the impacts of slow onset events, such as shrinking water sources, rising sea levels. Most people are aware of these things. What I'm a slightly surprised about, I suppose, as I've talked with people, is um, people seem to be far less aware of the knock-on consequences of these kind of things. Now, you'll be aware of those in Canada. I mean, you, you, with what you've been living with um, and, and the Lytton fires and, and just horrendous. But many people aren't aware of things like the trauma and the mental health impacts as people lose their land, their livelihoods and their, and their homes. So I've, got, I've pulled up an example here of the knock-on effects of climate change in the Solomon Islands. And there, what people see is as, as the sea levels rise and the water becomes salty, uh, obviously there's a, you can introduce salt tolerant seedlings for a while, but then there comes a point where they don't grow. So people can't grow their traditional crops and therefore they have to start importing other foodstuffs. And in the Solomon Island, that's things like rice and flour. So they adopt more, people are adopting a more Western diet and the incident of diabetes has gone through the roof. And that's a big strain on health resources. And so the, the, the consequences are just massive. And then the other one that's been alluded to, climate-induced migration. People don't appear as climate refugees. They appear as economic migrants. Economic migrants, I don't know what it's like in Canada, but they're not well regarded in the UK. And so you've got this mismatch of what's going on with how people present and helping people see the connections is really important. And the other thing with the migration, it's especially affecting young people. And with that, you get the disintegration of communities and what we see in another area of our work is people are much more vulnerable to exploitation and human trafficking. These are all related issues. And also the thing, uh, I mean, it, it still shocks me and I keep checking the statistic, the disproportionate impact on women. Women, boys and girls are 14 times more likely than men to die in a disaster. 14 times. It's huge. So it's vital we make those connections and see the bigger picture. But I also hope you get a sense from the video of how much is going on in terms of responses across the communion. And genuinely, this is just a tiny, tiny little section. Um, the Tongan youth are an example. They're one of my favorites. Um, they will have just been put into action with what's just happened, but we haven't heard yet how that's going. So back in 2017, the Anglican youth in Tonga were trained in disaster preparedness and response. And slightly sooner than they were expecting, they had to put it into practice as Cyclone Gita hit. And these are some of the things they did. They pre-positioned supplies. They did a community map. They knew where vulnerable people were. They contacted them before the storm hit and afterwards. And they did a big cleanup afterwards. But that's not the end of the story because um, through their endeavors, they got much more targeted aid into the affected community. And as a result, the um, diocese has uh, set up a climate change commissioner. And this story was referenced at COP25 in Madrid as uh, a Nobel Prize winner saying, this is what gives her, this is what courage looks like in the face of the climate emergency. And to hear a, an eminent scientist referencing Anglican youth as her inspiration was a really special moment. Um, so yeah, I wanted to just share that uh, story. So there's much more to that story, but what it, exem oops, sorry. What it exemplifies is that churches are often, as you'll know, the first responders in disasters. They respond sacrificially to welcome those who are affected, um, often out of their own means. Because they're a part of the local community, they can act fast. 
they knew, know who the vulnerable people are, they can act more quickly than outside agencies coming in. Uh, they're able to gather key information. Uh, and of course, they're there long after everyone else leaves, both the external agencies and the cameras. So churches are very much on the front line um, and need prayer and support uh, in these situations. So those are some examples of kind of local level responses across the communion. But I also wanted to draw out some of the more uh, communion wide responses that are happening. So as a source of encouragement and information, because these are places to go to as well for more resources and um, so on. So you've heard from Rachel, who's the secretary of the Anglican Communion Environmental Network. Uh, the website is on the Anglican Communion website. There is a host of exceedingly good resources um, to go and have a look at, uh, which give, have a global perspective. There are also something called eco bishops, um, who uh, you may, may well have heard of. Bishops who consciously make environmental concern a part of their work. And this is something we're hoping with the Lambeth Conference that we might have well, either many, many more or all bishops who have that as part of their identity. Uh, Rachel also re made reference to the prophetic indigenous voices on the planetary crisis video, uh, videos. They are stunning. There are four videos. Um, you can actually just Google that in YouTube um, and you'll find them or you can reach it through the Anglican Alliance website. Four beautiful videos and I'm going to come back to what they showed but they're from four very different parts of the communion and they very much had a common message which I, is what I want to come back to at the end. The Anglican communion also has a United Nations office so we have a permanent, permanent representative to the uh, United Nations, Jack Palmer White on the left in the picture. And in terms of environmental work, the Anglican Communion is an accredited observer, uh, a member, a non-governmental organization member of the Environment Programme, the Convention on Biological Diversity, and as of last year, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or UNFCCC. Um, again, I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. But so we have ways as a communion of connecting into the UN space and for the UN, what's happening there to connect into the communion. We can get grassroots Anglican voices into United Nations spaces. So, um, and then the other thing that happens across the communion is what we do as the Anglican Alliance. So we do all sorts of different things, but I'm just going to concentrate on what we do in the environment space. Uh, one of the things we were initially set up for, so we come out of the, uh, we were born of the 2008 Lambeth Conference and really initially to provide a convening platform after disasters. Uh, a bishop in Brazil said, we've just had a disaster, where was the Anglican communion? So this is a way we can connect across the communion in the aftermath of disasters, connecting the local affected community with Anglican uh, relief and development agencies, but for, for prayer support, for people not being left alone, uh, and hopefully for some other support as well. We've just recently had a round table for after the catastrophic flooding in Brazil. And that was really interesting because on that call, we were talking about support and immediate response, but also advocacy work that needed to be done. And that's actually where Linda Nichols and PWRDF were really engaged in, okay, so what's the advocacy potential with the mining companies who are behind a lot of the problems here? So that's, um, we're that broadening that, what, what's looked at in those aftermath of disaster scenarios. The Anglican Alliance is all about sharing best practice. 
And one of the things we do in this space is to help share best practice. There's a resource called Pastors and Disasters. If you don't know about it, that is a superb resource. Episcopal Relief and Development were the main um, uh, people behind that, with, but lots of Anglican partners. And also last year, we had the first iteration of the resilience course for the hot four which was global it was extremely successful uh, and this is about building resilience across the communion for disasters so people are better prepared know how to uh, cope um, and that will be developed regionally but i think we have been seeing resilience as something that's needed for vulnerable com communities the reality is every community is now vulnerable. There is no such thing as an unvulnerable community. Climate change has got to that point and we certainly need the mental resilience. So I think I would like to see that become a much more intentional act of resilience building across the communion. And that very much chimes in with the lament that Sylvia has just been talking about so powerfully. It's all the same thing. It's how do you cope with the current reality um, as, let alone actually to trying to mitigate and w w climate change, but how do we actually live with this pretty terrifying new reality? So that's what we're doing is the Alliance with the Resilience Course and so on. Um, and then we have our own resources. So we have a climate emergency hub on our website. Um, which has all sorts of the stories. That is the place to go to for some of the stories I've been sharing and a whole load more. Um, and facts and figures about climate change and so on. And we also have a bunch of prayer reflections um, to help people in that kind of way as well. And we have news stories and share stories of impacts and responses. So that's a very whistle-stop tour of the kind of things that are going on across the communion. And what I hope you'll have sort of picked up from that is that we there are different bodies at <clears throat> excuse me, communion-wide level who care passionately about this and are trying to work. And last year we really saw the much more intentional coming together of the Environment Network, the UN team, the Anglican Alliance, the Indigenous Network, and the Youth Network in preparation for COP26. Um, so I'm going to just do run through a few bits and bobs about uh, COP26. It was the first time that the Anglican Communion as a whole has was accredited to this process. So it, it gave us significant new opportunities as a whole body, as a whole uh, global body. We were able to make formal written submissions we could get voices from the community, communion into that space. We could have a delegation. It meant we were in the room, along with 25,000 other people, but it meant we could be there. So we did a lot of preparation in advance. We had three work streams. One was about equipping leadership, Anglican leadership. Um, webinar, we did run a series of webinars. We did a lot of written pieces. We, develop the website. We put together a policy position paper and we had a delegation. So we did these uh, uh, equip and enthuse Anglican leadership webinars, which seemed to go quite well. We were very pleased to get more than 50 bishops and nine uh, archbishops and participants from at least 34 countries. We lost count essentially, but they were a place to engage, uh, to really try and build the capacity of Anglican leadership. So they understood what was going on better. Obviously a lot of them would already know. We had our position paper which is all available on the website and here we wanted to focus on what is it that we can say as the communion because you could talk about it is huge and we decided we wanted to talk about climate resilience and just financing. So we really honed down on those. We wanted to get across in our policy recommendation the critical importance of faith actors um, you know, we've heard about certain wings of the church not caring about the environment. We don't have a good press in secular spaces as the church often. 
And part of our task was simply to try and say, look, we aren't, there aren't quite intelligent, sensible Christians who know what they're talking about and care. Um, we talk, wanted to talk about building resilience. We wanted to talk about localization of responses that local church knows what it's doing, just financing and the importance of technology transfer. So we had specific policies, but we also wanted to tell our story as the Anglican communion, sharing some of those things we see across the communion. And I'm going to come back to this overview effect, but it's important because as a communion, we have a different perspective from pretty well anyone else in the climate sphere. Faith-based organizations have it. We have something which astronauts call the overview effect because we have an identity that transcends national boundaries. And not many people have that. We are everywhere, we're local and we're global at the same time. And we can talk about this in a different way from most other people in the space. And that's, I think, what we need to build on. We put in a formal um, submission, it's all again on, on, on the website, it's available. And we had a delegation, a vast delegation of three of us. Uh, this is the official delegation. Sadly, um, our fourth member wasn't able to make it for personal reasons, which was really disappointing. Archbishop Julia Murray, who I'm sure is uh, familiar to you, he heads up, uh, he's the lead archbishop for the communion on environmental concerns. I went for the, uh, with the kind of overview and Nicholas Pandey uh, was our young representative from the Council of African Provinces in Africa. So I'm aware I need to speed up, sorry. Lots of other Anglicans were present, including Archbishop Mark MacDonald, Archbishop of Canterbury and others. Our role was to attend sessions, to share our messages and to build relationships. And that's what we worked very hard to do over two solid weeks. This is just a snapshot of some of those meetings um, and the opportunities we had. Um, Nicola Sturgeon is the woman on the top left, the uh, uh, first minister of Scotland. And we met the papal delegation and so on really trying to get our messages across into the space. This is a, a side event that Archbishop Mark was a, um, a, a, a key speaker on, sharing our messages. The COP26 space is very intense, passionate space. People inside care. Sometimes this narrative that people inside the Blue Zone didn't care, it's just not true. Um, there was a lot of concern and care. And people are aware that we are genuinely in the race of our lives. So, did we make a difference? Of course we didn't change the outcome of the COP as the Anglican Communion delegation. We were never going to. The opportunity to influence policy outcomes is between the COPs, and that's where the church comes in again to influence your national delegations in the space between the COPs so that they go with a different starting position. And that's our responsibility. So is there any point being there? Definitely. So I think moments make movements, they create energy, they release energy, and they can be used to change perceptions and understandings. And as I've said, I think that's a key bit of what we do as the communion. We have something incredibly precious, as I said. We're a global connected body with a shared identity that transcends national boundaries, borders. We can help change the narrative on climate change away from nationalism to connection. We are one body, one shared world. We sink or swim together. And that's what it's about. It's about connection and getting that message across. So where do we go from here? We have plans across to keep building the capacity of Anglican leadership. There'll be invitations to that, to change the narrative. We need to change the narrative. Call people to a bigger vision of a holistic vision. 
often religious leaders put it in terms of morality. It's much more than morality. It's about vision. It's about calling people to something better. And we need to be the change we want to see. I'm kind of feeling I've run out of time. So yeah, so I'm going to actually stop there. Um, there's loads more to say, but I'm sure Archbishop Mark can say it far better than I So thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, again, just a wonderful, broad and important sweep with that video on water, which was so evocative, and the use of scripture in that, very creative, and the role of relationships, both spiritual and pragmatic and political and international that you're fostering. It's very, very hopeful. And thank you for all your work. And thank you for presenting all of these rich resources for us today, too. Excellent. Yeah, it's, it's uh, fantastic. Now it's a great pleasure to welcome Archbishop Mark L. McDonald, the National Indigenous Anglican Bishop of Canada. And it's a real pleasure because Mark has been so helpful with the Trinity Sustainability Initiative, and he was the, the chief interlocutor and presenter and spiritual guide at our recent ground blessing ceremony of the new Lawson Center for Sustainability, which will be operating here at Trinity College. Archbishop MacDonald became Canada's first national Indigenous Anglican Bishop in 2007, after serving as Bishop of the U.S. Episcopal Diocese of Alaska for 10 years. In 2019, he was elevated to Archbishop. He has had a long and varied ministry, holding positions in Ontario, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Oregon, and the Southeast Regional Mission of the Diocese of Navajo Land. He has published extensively on creation care and the sacramental connections, between faith and the environment. And he stands both within the Anglican tradition, but also within the indigenous tradition of caring for and protecting Mother Earth. So Mark, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I wish the peace of God to all of you and uh, greet you all as, as my relatives. It's very, very nice to be a part of this uh, gathering. And uh, I want to begin by saying how much I appreciated uh, what has been said so far and uh, um, find, I find it uh, very encouraging. I need to start out and, and say something that I, I try to say all the time, hoping that eventually it will, uh, will, will be heard. And that is uh, the, with a, a, roughly a quarter of the world's uh, remaining usable land in the hands of indigenous peoples and an estimated 85% of the biodiversity uh, of our planet in indigenous hands, meaning under indigenous protocols, and, and I should say often not noticed that it's under indigenous protocols, um, as in the Kavango uh, issue that we, that, that, that uh, uh, Rachel mentioned before. But uh, their indigenous rights are an absolutely essential and integral part of a livable future for our planet. Uh, just look at the Arctic. There is, there is no livable future for our planet in which indigenous rights are not recognized. So uh, I, people often mention it as something, yes, we also have to do that. Um, I think that it should be understood that um, it, it's, it, it's essential. It's, it's not an adjunct. It's not a good thing to do at the same time. It is uh, essential to that, uh, to that reality. And also, as I'm going to speak about in a moment, um, the uh, indigenous understanding of the symbiotic living relationship that uh, that humanity has with creation is is a part of that livable future, and uh, and 
uh, I think that that too uh, is, is something that's important. Oftentimes it's portrayed like indigenous people will have a few tidbits that will make it uh, uh, nicer for, for us and that they have extraordinary insights into how different things work. Uh, the reality is that uh, there is a, uh, the seeds of a livable future in the indigenous worldview. Now, um, a number of years ago, I was in I was in the diocese of Minnesota, and uh, I was uh, uh, sitting in the back, uh, usually in in the um, um, especially in the American indigenous context. Uh, that was known as the Raven section, you know, where you sit back and listen and squawk every once in a while. And uh, there was a group of us, Ojibwe and Dakota. I was, I was sitting right uh, in front of them. And uh, uh, I, I should say that I often find myself because of uh, how I was raised and, and my life uh, in an interpretive role. So, uh, we were we were there, and uh, this is uh, about 30 years ago. But uh, Minnesota was one of the early adopters of of a, a creation season in the lectionary, and uh, a wonderful thing. And uh, and as I was sitting there, um, uh, the the person announcing this. Uh, this resolution that we would follow uh, uh, the, the lectionary of creation care, um, lections that focused on the relationship of uh, God to creation and creation to humanity and so on. And, uh, and I was sitting there and somebody tapped me on the back and I looked, I looked back and there was about six uh, indigenous people men and women, and they were looking at me like, what? And they had this strange look on their face. And, and, and they, they wanted me to tell them what on earth these people were talking about. And, and they, 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 um, uh, they, they, uh, they, um, they, said, I thought the whole Bible was about that. And uh, they, they, they lived in a universe, imagine it, where the, the relationship of their faith, their theology was never disconnected from, from creation and that living relationship. Uh, in fact, they couldn't imagine somebody reading that book, any page of that book, and getting any other uh, idea. Now, uh, I'm saying this because I, I think it's, it's, it's very important. The Western way of thought, particularly colonial thought, sees um, uh, sees uh, Christianity, often sees Christianity as an artifact of that culture. Um, we made it up, we invented it, you know, and often sees uh, that the theology and, and approach of the church today as, as simply an extension of what, what was before. Um, so we often, uh, see uh, people presenting uh, a more holistic approach to creation as something that we have discovered. Oh, gee whiz, That's, it's important that we do this. And, uh, and, uh, and I think that uh, this, is, this is like, this is like somebody who has destroyed their family through their drinking, and then looking around at the at the trouble and saying, "You know, I ought to be nicer. I ought to clean this up a bit." You know, 
And uh, maybe if I'm a little more positive in my thinking, um, or maybe if I, I'm more sorry about it, or all these sorts of things, now yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe things will be better. And the, the reality is that all of us who have been influenced by Western thought, um, and, uh, and believe me, I, I, I adore Western thought in, in many respects. There's wonderful things about it. Uh, but um, that uh, there has been a distortion, a, a rip that uh, is, is destroying our planet. And, uh, and it wasn't there not, not too long ago. Um, and simply slapping on what we think is an idea that we came up with about the environment is, is I don't think going to address the, the depth of the problem and the, the, the importance of, of, this, of, this, of, this, of, this, uh, of this idea. And I'm not saying that all of our answers are simply looking uh, to uh, indigenous thought or, or looking at um, our um, ancestors in the faith. But I, I do think that if we look at the ways in which our thought has departed from their understanding of the symbiotic relationship of humanity and creation, I, I think that would help us. Um, I, I often, even among environmentalists, I, I often get the feeling that uh, those of us who are environmentalists um, feel, uh, still have that uh, rupture between humanity and, and, and creation. So, um, so I, I've worked on various issues over time and uh, will often have, uh, I'll often have people say things like, well, you know, it's a, it would be horrible if we didn't have any wild places, you know, it, as, as if we could exist without them. Um, and the, I, the, the reality for us to understand, understand deeply, and I would say that scripture and indigenous thought uh, are, are confronting us with that, is that we, we might be able to process oxygen. And we might have blood pumping through our veins, but apart from creation, we are not human beings. And uh, to think, to think that is uh, 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 that that humanity can exist apart from this world which God has created us to live in harmony with is not just hubris, it's stupidity. It's, 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 it's a stupidity born of that kind of idolatry that uh, saw uh, ancient Israel um, do, uh, create such misery for itself and also uh, the kind of misery that you see in uh, you know addiction and other 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 things. It is um, uh, it is important, uh, 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 brothers, sisters, relatives, that we uh, that 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 we find a new way to live. But it is also important for us to understand clearly the problem that led to this. And I think to to uh, to uh, to th simply think that, oops, we, we we didn't realize that there were some by bad byproducts of this of this reality, is is to to miss the deliberate the deliberate blindness of the the way in which uh, we have lived on on the planet. And, and, and probably never be able to, to recognize and realize what, it, what, is, what is, is, is the problem. Now, um, uh, I, 
again, um, I'm, I'm, I'm indebted to elders who have helped me to understand uh, things that are, uh, are important in our Christian faith. Um, and um, it is important for uh, people to understand that indigenous people had agency in the acceptance of Christianity in its basic form. It is important to understand that they, they weren't beaten into it, they weren't um, um, hoodwinked into it. That, um, and and you, you have to understand really that, um, that there is a Christianity that has existed underground uh, in, uh, among Anglicans, among Roman Catholics, uh, that, that has been hidden from the missionaries because they, they knew the difficulty. It would, it would cause, that has nurtured this, this kind of spirit. So Albert Tritt, the great Buchin prophet, he says, uh, the way of the white man leads to death, the way of Jesus leads to life. He saw a clear distinction and difference between what the missionaries taught and what Jesus said. And it is, it is, it is time for us to, uh, to realize with, 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 with every fiber of our being that all the graves of those children is deeply and intimately connected with the way in which we are making our planet unlivable today. And so uh, I think the elders understood that reality and, and lived in it that way. So, I want to say thank, thank you to them for helping me uh, to, uh, at least uh, in a preliminary way, uh, awaken from my uh, idolatrous stupor. Um, and I think uh, what I would like to say, uh, we have tended to talk about spirit and matter. Um, Jesus, really talked about the new and the old. And, and uh, as, uh, as uh, Maximus the Confessor, who's been my hero lately uh, um, of the, the seventh century, he, uh, he talked about uh, Jesus being the place where uh, creation and God meet. That this, that, uh, this is not just where uh, humanity uh, gets a, 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 a an uplift in its religious outlook. Uh, this is this is this is where these two things come together. And uh, as as the elders would tell us, um, in the in the bread and the cup, this is where um, creation meets new creation. Uh, this is where artifacts from the future become present in, 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 the, in the now. That uh, it shows to us that every aspect of our life is involved in uh, lifting up or revealing is perhaps a better way, that connection between old and new, that the uh, death, resurrection, and death and resurrection of Christ is, um, is, is, is so clear. Now, um, James, he said, we are the first fruits of a new creation. And uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 uh, speaks of a time when God will be all in all. Of course, in Romans 8, where the, we refer to the moaning, the groaning of creation, you know, um, it, it's, Astonishing to me that we can think creation is groaning to not exist anymore, and and uh, and that uh, as as uh, especially in the Eastern tradition, um, there there that what happens to creation is a type of resurrection. That what was originally planned for creation is what we what we see in Christ, um, and that. Uh, this coming together uh, is something 
that we are called to live today, um, that we are called to be today. And uh, we, we, uh, we have to, to, to give ourselves to this new reality, um, as, as many of you have said. Um, I, I, um, uh, I, I once spoke to some elders uh, in Navajo land about how they understood uh, Western society. And uh, they said, uh, it, it's, it's astonishing what they have accomplished, but um, it is, and I should say that, that um, they're, they're more than willing to uh, share in that technology uh, if it can be submitted to the morality and cosmology of their way of life. And, uh, and usually it can, but they said uh, what has happened in the, in the, in, they didn't call it the West, but, but for purposes of this conversation, what has happened in the West is that they have uh, uh, lost a part of who they are. In Navajo uh, thought, it is the, 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 the female part. Uh, I would, Say mat, na, na, Navajo culture is matrilocal, matrilineal, and matriarchal. So, uh, 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 don't and 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 when uh, in Navajo cosmology, the female is the active part, the male is the passive part. So, so please understand that. But, but what is is critical uh, is is that uh, because. Uh, uh, the, the West in, in, in this Navajo analysis uh, severs the connection uh, between male and female. Um, it, uh, it has given itself uh, uh, Frankenstein, Frankenstein-like the capacity to build all these spectacular things. But the cost has been its soul and there's a cost that the planet is now uh, now attending uh, to it it seems to me that god has planted the seeds of our future in our past and and that we must uh, not think that we can we must reinvent christianity to make it uh, to make it more environmentally palatable I think we have to reinvent the West and, and uh, to understand its great achievements, its wonders, the, the, the many things that have, it has given to the world that are good, but at a cost, at a great cost. And I think uh, the, that the vision that our elders had for, for, for Canada, as articulated by Chief Elijah Harper, that, um, this is a this is a great land uh, in in Ojibwe Aski uh, in Ojibwe Aki. It's a great ecosphere, so great that we can bring people in and share it and have uh, 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 and and with a just relationship with the first people of the land and with the land, we can build a better life for our children and grandchildren. I think that that's, that's the vision we must have now for our planet. And, uh, and to understand the urgency uh, that uh, uh, there are so many things that we must do about, uh, about climate change and, and about how we live. But the urgency of recovering that intimate relationship between humanity and creation ought to be for us job number one. Uh, if we could do that for people, uh, if we could, if we could uh, show them a world that uh, is uh, 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 new, I think it would be, I think, I think we, we would have done pretty much. So anyway, thank you very, very much for allowing me to share these things.
I'm very happy to be a part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Archbishop McDonald, for your inspiring, insightful words, as always. And I really appreciate the job number one, the clarification of that restoration of intimacy and of relationality. And the passion with which you express that helps guide many of us uh, into these waters. So thank you. And I see now that we're nearing the end of our time, Chris. <laughs> um, there are, I just wanted to note, um, uh, thanks to Ken Gray, who had put in the Q&A earlier that pilgrimage is a key activity throughout the Ecclesiastical Province of BC Yukon for 2022, four, possibly five now in development. So building on uh, that notion of pilgrimage, which is great. And I know that we are coming to the end of our time and Chris has some wrap up words. So I just wanna share a quote that came to mind um, as the panels were, panelists are speaking and uh, as Archbishop Mark McDonald was speaking. And this is a quote from um, Marina Herrera. And Marina Herrera is a um, indigenous woman who lives and writes along the US-Mexico border. And she writes about harmony with the land. Harmony with creation is grounded deeply in one's relationship with the land. For most Native Americans, it is impossible to speak of a personal identity apart from the land. The earth grounds us not only geographically, but psychologically. As my grandmother told me, when I lost touch with Mother Earth, I misbehaved. When I attended to the land, however, my behavior improved. In other words, the land itself can heal. And thank you for all of you for bringing healing, restorative, and inspiring ideas, thoughts, pragmatic actions, political initiatives, and your spirit of love and compassion uh, to this panel today. So it's been a privilege to be with you today. Thank you. Now over to you, Chris. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Stephen. And thank you to our panelists uh, from both, both this morning and this afternoon. It's been a, a, both a delight, but also quite humbling and challenging to be in your presence today. So I thank you for that, for the time and the care you've given to this. Uh, you, you've, we've heard an awful lot to challenge us, uh, uh, but also hope, I hope to inspire us and uh, to renew our souls and to give us some hope. I mean, resources and, 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 and challenges from across the Anglican communion, communion across the globe, um, deep dives into the, the wealth of the Christian tradition and its spirituality, and, uh, and uh, a reminder from uh, Archbishop Mark to make sure that that is linked uh, to the land in a deep way, as indeed scripture and the tradition would call us to and uh, indigenous peoples have continued to witness to uh, consistently throughout our history. Um, to our, our attendees, thank you so much for joining us uh, in this conversation. Uh, we hope you found something that really inspires you and, and renews you, um, so, some, some thoughts, uh, that you have not occurred to, or some some um, examples from lived practice that might might encourage you in your in your own ministries and efforts, uh, and uh, please uh, let's uh, uh, keep keep one another in prayer as we go into this weekend, um, and as we all uh, continue to uh, mull over what we've experienced today and incorporate that into our own way of life going forward. Thank you, everyone, and, and blessings to you all, and. Uh, May God be with us in this work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a good weekend. Yeah. Blessings. Thanks to all the panelists.